Thanks so much, Lawrence, and thank you also, Rosalia and Alan and um, uh, Green College and the Asia Pacific Dispute Resolution Project for bringing me over and to all of you for coming. Uh, I hear that uh, every lecturer in this seminar series uh, starts by saying, but I don't know anything about South Asia, so don't expect this. And I, I think I'm going to start similarly. Uh, you've heard about the many kind of issues that I'm, how, how thinly I'm spreading. And this is an interdisciplinary college. This talk will be in the same spirit. Uh, I know very little about a bunch of topics, and I'll try to fruitfully connect them and apologize in advance for my ignorance on the individual ones. Medical tourism is not when a doctor leaves one country to go treat patients in another country. It's rather when patients go across borders to get typically non-emergent care. So a Canadian going to the Caribbean to get a cosmetic surgery, a French person traveling to India to undergo cardiac surgery, things like that. It can also be moving from a poor country to a richer country, Belgium has medical tourists in it. We'll talk about a source country, the country from which the patient arrives, and a destination country to which they travel. It used to be almost exclusively surgeries and now expands to further areas. Why do people go? First factor in the global picture, if you look at the masses of medical tourists, is that it's cheaper in some countries. Uh, personnel and other factors are cheaper and it's possible to offer cheaper, pri lower prices. The example on the screen is, is quite extreme, but you can cut costs if you move abroad. And um, in many places, as far as we know, the clinical outcomes are just as good or better uh, certainly the, what the patient could afford in their home country. It's very patient-oriented or even client-oriented, uh, the gamma ray, MRI, all those things that one often doubts the patients even really need are available there. It's very flashy, um, very lavish hospitality packages in many, in many hospitals. People combine this with regular tourism can get your yoga while you're there in India and see the place. And there are various reasons to go to the Caribbean in the winter from Canada or Boston and undergo surgery and also see the place. And for Canadians, uh, you guys uh, get your health care covered, but you can jump the queue if you um, go get it elsewhere. And sometimes there are services that you can't get here. So suppose you're in dialysis and your doctor told you, that you uh, really won't survive long uh, if you keep on dialysis. Ideally, you would get a kidney, but you wouldn't have a relative who matches and nobody else would donate it. You could, in principle, go to a, another country. It's illegal elsewhere as well, but you could do that illegal transaction in some places in Chennai in India and maybe get yourself a live kidney from a local seller. Um, and so that exists as well. In some countries, you can't purchase surrogacy uh, services, and um, surrogacy is, is very big in, the, in this um, medical tourism picture. This is uh, an expanding industry. It will, it's already huge. People talk about this, say, in a country like India as something which will be as big in the economic future of the country as we now are now thinking about the IT sector, very big. It's going to expand further in the future, presumably, when there is more and more tendency to use these services. Right now, people are a little conservative. Insurers are conservative about it. But um, maybe in the future, we'll see more and more insurers who tell their patients the patient participation part will be lower if you do it in a place which is cheaper for us and we deem the services there to be just as good. 
and maybe later they will say private insurers or national insurance will be saying to patients, look, if you want any coverage, really, you have to do it there because there is no reason why the NHS in Britain say, you know, the, the British taxpayer should be paying you for your conservatism. Just go and do it in, the, in a country where the services are cheaper. Um, so we do expect uh, this industry to continue to expand. There was a little blip uh, with the economic recession, but not a huge one, and it's continuing. Um, this exists all over the world, in, big in the Caribbean, big in northern Latin America, big in the Gulf countries, in Turkey, in Malaysia, in Singapore. But the biggest center um, globally are currently in India and Thailand, and I will focus on these countries today. Um, this is uh, the most famous uh, center in, in uh, Thailand. Um, this is a picture of uh, one of the many lobbies in this very plush hospitals, hospital. This is one of the big centers uh, of the Apollo chain, which is the biggest uh, chain in India, and I think the biggest hospital chain in the, in the entire world. Um, um, and this is another uh, picture taken in the same city, New Delhi. One ethical concern that people have about this industry is that there is something almost indecent ethically about this painful proximity of this opulence and, and utter luxury and the dire poverty that exists in such countries as India or for some people in Thailand. Um, there are many stories in the press about um, kind of characterizing the, the real stark contrasts. Uh, there, there was a New York Times article um, talking about the ice cream stashed in the fridge in the four-star hotel of the medical tourists who come from abroad. Should they have any uh, urge to, to have some of that? Meanwhile, in the public clinic just around the corner, uh, the patients there, if they can even see a nurse, you know, the food there is this stale piece of bread with cockroaches crawling on it. I'm not going to talk today about that ethical challenge. Basically what is happening there is there are, you know, we know that the world is full of these big, big, big gaps and what this did is in a way not fiddle with the numbers, it just made us made the, the stark global differences be very geographically near each other. And whether that is worse than this or the other way around is, is not a concern that I will address today. What I will address today is worries that because of this, the gap is increasing and specifically that this in some important ways harms the people who are here. So maybe it helps these people at the top. Maybe now the Canadians have this extra option that they didn't have before for getting their medical care. And an option that may well be good for them. It's, it's cheaper and, and all that. Whether or not it's good for the people in the global north, if you will, for the tourists, um, the worry is that in a significant way it undermines people here. And that is what we will discuss today. Specifically, what people worry about is that this is taking away the health workers from underserved populations in India and Thailand and reserving them for the tourists. So some quotes here, there are fears that this um, industry is luring away professionals from, we're talking about the remote rural areas in India moving to the cities or in the cities moving from the public sector to the private sector. In Thailand, it's the, the north, sorry, in the northeast from your direction is very badly underserved, but cities um, have a lot of doctors and we're talking about that kind of movement. So that translates specifically if you need a specialist and you don't, you now need more money to lure that specialist to be, to work with you because 
they can charge more for their services in the city without even needing to leave the country. They can stay with their family and all, but they can get more. Why should they treat you if you have very little uh, for them? And for other doctors, just, you know, they don't exist anymore for the local poor. Uh, the local poor rely on the public services, but the doctors now have other options, other local options, local, by local I mean in the country. Um, they will not go uh, work for the local poor. That's the worry. I want to say something about medical personnel shortages around the world. Uh, this is a big problem that I guess the 2006 World Health Report brought to the fore. Uh, look uh, in this map, uh, you've probably seen such maps, uh, countries are kind of bloated or shrunk in accordance with the size of an issue in them. So very much implicated is India, Pakistan, but mainly Sub-Saharan Africa and maternal mortality. This map represents death from HIV AIDS. India again is very strongly represented and especially Sub-Saharan Africa is represented. Look now especially at Sub-Saharan Africa for the human resources in terms of uh, doctors that they have for dealing with these acute challenges. So AIDS is a disease that requires very close attention from a doctor. Um, usually the way we organize uh, AIDS treatment nowadays, we have organized it. And these are the human resources available in Sub-Saharan Africa. Interestingly, I'm, when people talk about, when the World Health Report talks about countries, I mean, there are, there are shortages of physicians all over the world, including in this country, many areas in this country. But there's, it's one thing to have moderate shortages, severe shortages, and quite another to have critical shortages defined as below a certain uh, density of doctors or nurses or other health workers per population. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, we're talking about a particularly sick population. That doesn't even go into the numbers. When countries uh, face these challenges, um, well, let me actually, let me, I want actually to, to actually um, focus for a minute about why India is not so implicated in this, although for the World Health Organization, these critical shortages are especially prevalent in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia, meaning mainly India and Pakistan. Um, why is India not so small in this map? Because we need to take into account also disparities inside countries. So look at this country of, map of one uh, country in Sub-Saharan Africa, you see differences between different areas inside the country. And this is uh, exactly why India is not so, so small in this map. In the cities in India, you have western levels of density of doctors and nurses working in these private hospitals for tourists and the growing local middle class. Try to find a doctor in a remote rural area in India there was a letter to The Lancet a few years ago titled, Only the Dead See a Doctor. That was by an English, I think, resident who went to India um, and, and spent several months in a remote rural area. There is never access to a doctor. It's only a person with some training who does some tasks delegated to these persons uh, from doctors who provides any kind of care, there is one task that legally they have to get you a doctor for, and that's certifying that you're dead. Hence, only the dead see a doctor. This is basically, I think, a fair way of describing the access to physicians, and we should be very pessimistic about access to any form of health uh, uh, service in, in remote rural areas in India and in Northeast Allen. Does this harm patients? Well, um, I think the evidence is, uh, has been in for several years, and the answer is yes. Uh, shortages do harm patients. Um, the 
study here is actually um, Thiel Bannighausen, who is mentioned below there. Uh, he's a co-author. This is a study that he did uh, as a doctoral student uh, at Harvard. Um, and this is the graph that opens the World Health Report 2006. Uh, if you do interesting work as doctoral students, um, you can have a lot of impact on the world. So pick, cho choose well. Um, it correlates, density of doctors correlates with um, um, under one uh, survival, under five survival, uh, maternal survival during labor. We know that uh, lack of doctors and other health workers is often a bottleneck to the provision of treatment for HIV AIDS, for very basic interventions such as childhood vaccinations, just look at the differences between different areas and depending on the density of uh, health personnel, and specifically doctors, even for these basic interventions, um, um, the numbers uh, are, are um, pretty compelling and that was recognized by WHO years ago. So the question is how do we address these shortages? Um, I, I want to emphasize that this plays out not just in, say, Sub-Saharan Africa, but also, and or Canada, but also we find this correlation very much in the countries that we're talking about. Um, um, these are major obstacles both for provision of health services and for improvement of health outcomes. Um, Specifically, uh, I'll mention this report from Thailand. It's a very recent report. Uh, Thailand had, has a um, uh, universal coverage scheme uh, that was very successful in many ways uh, and, and wanted some independent advice on, on how it's doing and what to change. Uh, this year, a uh, committee of very senior people at WHO, very well respected, Thai health experts uh, sat down and examined it. They uh, tied the um, some bottlenecks to the rolling out of, of this, in many ways, fantastic scheme uh, uh, to um, underserved populations in Thailand uh, to shortages which they connected to the attraction of um, private hospitals in the cities for these health workers. However, it's a complex picture. Some people deny altogether there is any deleterious effect on the local population. So they, for example, emphasize some offsetting effects. They say, look, if the doctors are not going to be attracted to these private hospitals in the city, what will they do? Will they really treat these uh, patients in these uh, dirty, under-equipped public hospitals for very poor salaries? No, they will maybe travel to another country. So in fact, this is great for the poor. It brings back doctors. So Indian doctors who used to go to the UK are now happy to work in New Delhi and they have more doctors, not less doctors, thanks to these private hospitals. They also emphasize there are more hospital beds in the country. Apollo, I think by 2015, is planning to have 12,000 beds. I think the problem with this specific reply is that it's not like any of this is available automatically for the local poor. Yes, there are more hospital beds and more doctors in the country as a result, but that doesn't mean more access to the local poor. People talk about Skill exchange, it's a good thing when doctors move between contexts, etc. but if doctors move in one direction only, there is no impact back on the public sector. It cannot really borrow norms and knowledge from the private, more professional sector. There do remain doubts, and I think our colleagues from Simon Frazier have, have helped us see that. There do remain doubts about whether there is a net harm uh, for the local poor because the picture is complex. So I'll mention some effects. Um, there's a lot of money influx of these people from abroad. Somebody's making money. You can tax that person. With a tax, you could in principle 
fund schemes for the local poor, public health for the local poor. A lot of the income is made by foreign owners, for example, the big hostels, his big hostel we mentioned in Thailand is owned by Americans. In Thailand, we've seen that shortages of physicians are a bottleneck to providing help uh, to the poor, so it's not so, so clear that the tax is capable of, of addressing the health needs of the populations that lose from internal brain drain. And in India, there is a complex situation in which for many years, I think quite chronically, a lot of health experts in India and elsewhere say, India has been under investing, under funding uh, the public health sector. Um, and there are drives to change that every few years and they say, we now have money, we should really do that and it kind of doesn't happen. So given that the finance ministry will not let it happen, maybe for bad reasons, but it will not let it happen, I think it's hard to count on that uh, offsetting the potential harms. There is a lot of speculation, as uh, our colleagues from Sound Fraser have helped us see, there is a lot of speculation about the harms and about the fabulousness of the benefits. And what we do need is better evidence, uh, which is only halfway in, I think. Um, but I want to warn us about waiting for the evidence to be definitive before trying to take any action, before trying to devise any policy on this. Um, I don't know if you know the, the book, Doubt is the, Our Product. Um, it's a wonderful 2008 book about the history of how industry, especially the tobacco companies, have deliberately sowed doubt. So that is what the tobacco companies, advertising companies, were doing for years and a bunch of other industries have been doing for years is it really that clear that the smoking is what, I mean, it correlates, but is it cost us 30 years or longer and an untold number of lives because we hesitate to take action because somebody pointed out some doubt. And there is, there are very interested um, uh, parties in this discussion too. Uh, some of the writing is highly conflicted and we shouldn't, I think, always uh, side with, let's have a little extra research rather than do anything about this. But the factor that I want to emphasize most um, about these doubts that I continue to have about what exactly is happening, what um, exactly is the ultimate picture, is it more net harm than net benefit for the local poor, if net harm, which is what I suspect is the picture, is it much more net harm, or which is what I suspect is the case, or not so much. Still, I think we can all agree, no matter what our pictures of what exactly is going on, that if there were a way to increase uh, the factors that operate for the poor and decrease the ones that um, operate against the poor, that would be a good thing. Uh, so long as the toll on the other party is kind of acceptable, but from an ethical point of view, I think that in this area and in many other areas, uh, it's, it's very healthy. And usually it's a good rule of thumb to say the interests of the most vulnerable and the worst off populations globally, they should usually determine what is the right thing to do. Um, so long as the impact on other parties is not huge and there are no huge violations of ethical constraints, really we should go with the interests of the worst off. And if there was a way here to ensure that we're doing that, or close to ensuring, that would be the way to go no matter what the picture currently is. So is there such a way to, um, to do that? Is there a way to uh, make medical tourism, no matter what it's currently doing to the poor, benefit them much more than harm them? Or maybe I should have put it differently. 
come much closer than it is now, wherever it is right now, to benefiting more than harming. Or to harming less and benefiting more. So I'm going to um, describe a pie in the sky. Later on we'll discuss whether there is a way to kind of grab that pie and, and bring it from the utopia to, to here. Here's the pie in the sky. Imagine tourist hospitals that can remain, you know, they can do their thing. They can uh, help these Canadian and American and British, etc. tourists. They can help the local elites. It's fine. They can generate the taxes and um, all that. But they also help the poor medically much more. And their personnel helps local underserved populations much more than they currently do. That's probably good if we could achieve that. How could they help more? Well, a variety of ways. Uh, they could be, the health workers could be getting their salary 12 months a year and uh, spend a quarter of that time in some remote rural area helping uh, local patients rather than foreign patients. Um, they could do that via telemedicine. That's an arrangement whereby the doctor speaks on the phone either directly to the patient or to a local less qualified and less expensive health uh, personnel and, and they kind of do the care that way and it, it works surprisingly well. They could do what they currently by Indian laws for example uh, are, should have done in principle these Indian hospitals when they got a lot of loans from the government um, have contracted to reserve 10% of the beds in the hospitals for local patients, which we have uh, reports both from journalists and a decision from an Indian court is, is kind of not happening right now. So they could do that. They could be buying some campaigns of their doctors to go to the remote rural areas and do vaccination campaigns, diagnostic campaigns, bring the doctors maybe back to the ones who di were diagnosed as you know, the children who need the congenital heart surgery, yeah, come with us to the hospital. We'll provide the surgery there to select patients. Um, they do some of that. I'm talking about doing it way more than it's happening right now. They could be, I've heard uh, uh, there was a suggestion uh, by one of Lawrence's uh, colleagues in the seminar that he mentioned, she, she suggested to me, um, they could be setting up hospitals in remote rural locations uh, which would serve the tourists. The tourists probably wouldn't mind much spending the few days in India in a remote rural location rather than the city. Might even be safer and they would see another part of India. But de facto that would, in addition to these tourists, uh, serve much more the local population of poor rather than being captured by the local enormous middle class. Various ways like to do that, but this is a pie in the sky. Why would they ever do that? They are for profit companies, very much for profit companies. Um, how could we make that happen? Um, I did mention this thing that part of this is already in the contract, reserving some hospital beds, and they don't do it. Why don't they do it? Um, maybe some money is exchanging hands, but I think most fundamentally, Indian government knows that it cannot afford to demand such things from their hospitals because this costs a lot of money. They would have to jack up the prices for tourists and the minute the prices are a little higher uh, for the same quality in India compared to Thailand, Caribbean, Central America, etc., uh, the tourists, they're like, you know, they're like uh, capitalist companies. They would move to another country. So um, how do you do that? You could hope for the industry. People talk about the industry self-regulating. Um, they have their own little uh, associations that uh, make me promises. I, uh, without further argument, I, I think this is just hopeless uh, to expect that this for-profit industry will 
come, come forth and, and uh, become, you know, lose a lot of money for the sake of um, stopping just to announce in their, each, each of the, uh, some of these hospitals have a sort of community involvement web page where you can see uh, some very small operations compared to the overall uh, volume of operations, um, which they make a lot of fuss about for them to just want for the sake of being good to really be substantially good, I think that's, that's just not going to happen. I don't think that any individual government can afford to really start regulating very rigorously its own industry. Um, by analogy, when Bangladesh became serious about regulating what's happening in the sweatshops, they cleaned up their act and immediately the sweatshops moved to China. It's just a problem bigger than one country and, and no one country, I think, can, can deal with it. We need some sort of global leviathan uh, to resolve what is fundamentally a collective action problem, a prisoner's dilemma between different countries. You might think WHO or some international organizations of that sort could do it, but WHO chronically lacks teeth. Um, they have the lawyers in the room um, could tell us more about this. Uh, WHO is in no position to uh, impose uh, such uh, sanctions. So what, what could be done? I'm going to talk about what I call GILs, Global Health Impact Labels, uh, which I shall define as follows. These are accreditations that certify that some company was rigorously reviewed by a body of independent experts with the best available evidence, with community representatives, with country representatives. Uh, whatever you believe gives you very good expertise, they could have it. And they have independence. They are not like the professional association. It was reviewed by this independent body and found to have a sufficiently favorable impact on global health in some specific way or overall. By global health, I shall mean the health of the poorest and least healthy populations in the world. Many such people reside in rural areas in India, in cities in India, and also in sub-Saharan Africa and other areas where there are currently critical shortages of health personnel. Um, any company could be reviewed, any type of company could be reviewed by these panels of experts for any kind of operation. So it's not just about the sort of problems we're discussing today. It's, it's a notion that uh, I thought about independently. So it could be, I, there could be a gill for that South African um, construction company that provides the most uh, screening and access to antiretrovirals to its employees. So the mining sector, as bad as it is to its employees in many ways, has been quite good on HIV. Construction sector, frustratingly, not so generous. And um, the idea is there would be a certification for that construction company that does that creating some sort of incentive, in a minute we'll discuss what kind of incentive that provides, for the companies to compete for that, for the, and creating an incentive for them to provide uh, screening and, and access to antiretrovirals. It could be for that company operating in India or in Britain that donated the most money to a good, according to the experts, organization for promoting global health. I don't know, Doctors Without Borders. And it's not just that they donated some money. The experts say, this counts as very substantial money. It's not just that they fool us all by having this glamorous web page. This is a serious, this one is a serious operation. And they did good thinking and they donated it to a good organization. It could be to a company that is good for the health of the employees in ways that 
you and I, the consumers, could never tell. Who, who, in what kind of position are we to tell that the toy producer is having safe conditions for the employees? Well, the experts are in a somewhat better position, and they could give us some sort of tag, some sort of label um, that could be advertised on the product if the company wants but it could also be advertised independently by the experts on their websites. Uh, you could have access to these data um, through apps that would, that would operate. If you go on a consumer uh, website, there are such, some such things nowadays. So you go to Amazon, in addition to the stars that uh, they provide for how much customers thought the quality of the product was high, you could also maybe get stars or green versus red versus amber for the impact of that product or the company producing that product on global health. You could be directing your phone to the barcode code on the product and get that information. There are many ways to disseminate the information. Um, in the medical tourism sector, I'm envisaging a guild that would assess how much hospitals and the middlemen who works with these hospitals and the insurers, say in the private insurance company in America, that work with these middlemen companies that send you to these hospitals, how much do they provide the pie in the sky that we talked about earlier? So how much does that hospital, in, in, in a second, how much does that hospital do the sort of things that we want them to do for the local poor. How much of these middlemen companies work exclusively with hospitals that do that? How much, etc. So uh, going up the, the food chain. Uh, maybe, so I'll, I'll get to the question before we get to these details. Yeah. private insurer in the United States or whether it's a middleman, it's hard to tell the difference between who these people are these days. Because one corporation owns another corporation owns another corporation. So I'm talking about corporate governance here. Oh, yeah, and thanks. Corporations don't give a damn about anything but the bottom dollar. I mean, it's as simple as that, right? So how do you get an accredited group of people who are not affiliated with these corporations or paid by these corporations or in any way, you know, I mean, because of it's just going to be the same runner on the internet. It's all PR. Like, if you take recently where IKEA, who is considered one of the most great companies in the world and sustainable and all these things, spent 20 years using German slave labor out of prisons to build a goddamn printer. Yeah. It makes no sense to do this. Like, I can't see where how that's going to work. Right? Unless you really well, have. Uh, so that makes it. I, I, I agree that the main factor that operates for corporations is. Um, the draw of mammon. We're, we're on the same page there. What I'm counting on is not their kind-heartedness, but on creating material incentives such that even a selfish, materially driven corporation would have some material incentives um, to um, do good. In what, uh, what's the mechanism basically impact on parties who care? So, the, so the thought, so the thought is, uh, in general, there are consumers who, some consumers care, some investors care, some potential workers care, some business partners care, importantly, some regulators care. Um, and the thought is, if you make it very transparent to them, who is good and who is bad in that respect, it and the companies know that you're creating that, it would give the companies a scare. Gosh, we might face investor activism. We might face regulators who don't allow Walmart to open a branch in this town. Um, they might hold us accountable, because these are experts. It's not the general public whom you can fool so easily, for what we did back in the 70s, back in the Second World War. Um, there is some interesting question there about what, how long do you hold companies responsible? Because you also, even in terms of creating, you know, incentives, you do want them also to have an incentive to improve their act. And a lot of the companies with a lot of 
corporate social responsibility are the ones who have very good reason to work on their PR in that respect, who have dirty histories. So, so Um, about, so I, it depends on what state you have in mind. If you're talking about the individual states in this context, I've mentioned that I don't think that the Indian government or the Thai government has the force to address this prisoner's dilemma between them. You may be talking about the Canadian government in this, in this context. Um, start sounding more interesting and, 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 um, Maybe there's something to be said for this. In a, in a minute, we'll, we'll discuss some related options. So um, here is the simplest way that I think such a, such a thing could work. There is this organization. It's called JCI, uh, Joint Commission International. It's affiliated with um, the organization that certifies 95% of the hospitals in the US for the quality of medical care provided there. So certifying the quality of the surgery you can get in that hospital. Also a bunch of other things, some of them actually a little closer to ethics. Um, what's the quality of the informed consent you get there? Do they, something about third parties not paying customers. By and large it's all about the quality of care provided to paying customers. But also say, if they send away somebody who arrives with a knife stab uh, bef before stabilizing them, um, that's a requirement that is the law. There is a law called Antala in the U.S. Uh, that these hospital certifiers apply in the U.S. And I guess probably for that reason, they also apply that to all these hospitals that they certify for the quality of their operations in India and Thailand and Turkey and, and elsewhere. So you want to get JCI accreditation if you want to get referrals from the doctors of patients in the US or Canada. That's, they, they um, are very predominant in that area. Suppose we could convince JCI to include along with their more than 300 standards something about the pie in the sky that we mentioned earlier. So from now on, we demand uh, that if you want to get our certification, you need also to do one of the following things, uh, provide these 10% of beds that you're actually supposed by Indian um, law to uh, provide, or provide the surgeries, etc., and the health personnel in the rural areas, things of that sort. I think that would create a very strong incentive for these hospitals to do that. Currently, they are going a very long way, doing very expensive things, to meet JCI expectations. They could do that even if it helps the poor. Not sure we can convince JCI to do that, um, but that would be one option. Maybe another reputed body, maybe the Canadian government, uh, maybe Jimmy Carter, WHO, uh, Better Business Bureau, some organization that has some sort of independent repute already, ideally, um, would um, start a guild for the medical tourism industry and have a panel of experts uh, that uh, visit many countries and um, uh, help um, provide credible certifications on whether hospitals are good for the health of the local poor or not. The most difficult, I can imagine that such an arrangement would work relatively easily with countries like your country uh, or Britain or whatever, where public officials who are thinking about whether to send in the future in some kind of 10 years, uh, thinking about whether to send Canadian patients to a hospital, hospitals in India to get their care. What does it cost the public official to vote yes for sending the patient to the certified hospital rather than to the hospital that, it cause it, that is costing so direly potentially for the local poor in India? It costs them out of their pocket very little and I can 
very much imagine this happening in countries with uh, national or, or kind of state-organized health insurance systems. What do we do with the U.S.? Uh, many of these uh, uninsured, uninsured uh, medical tourists come from the U.S. and will come in the future despite the, AC, the Obamacare. There will remain some underinsured and uninsured Americans. Um, what do we do about that? We could, I think, still do something even there. So a GIL based, say, with one of these reputed bodies or an independent GIL would be saying that insurance company is working with the middlemen who don't have the certification and these middlemen work with the uncertified hospitals so they don't get our gill. That insurance company works with the right chain and they do get our gill. Why would these insurance companies uh, mind about that? Because I think we can very much count on the competition, the certified insurance company, to promulgate that fact for us. They will make a fuss about this. They will tell patients, come work with us. Do you know what it means? Let me, let me cash it out. Let me tell you what uncertified means. It means really, did you ever see a picture of a mother who died at labor? Let us show you a picture in the, po I've, I've seen a picture of this, some very shocking lecture on the brain drain that remained with me. Uh, they could show us very shocking pictures of how physician shortages look and what it means to work with these companies. And these companies have many departments. They stand to lose a lot if they lose their reputation for being health, ethically, ethical health-wise. It's not just the relatively small nowadays medical tourism operations. It might deter patients on a broader basis. Of course, not all patients, but it's enough for that to demotivate a whole lot of patients um, uh, for it to create incentives to pay just a little extra and work with a certified company. Um, of course, if you do have many gills, one for medical tourism, one for uh, provision of antiretrovirals in the construction sector in a different country, one for how much companies donate, one for how much they do not pollute, etc. You need some sort of coordination between them. You need to address worries about industry plugging some bogus gills, and that's a very difficult concern to, to address. I, I, I've, um, I have my attempts uh, to do that. I'm envisaging some sorts of gill umbrellas uh, that bring together the good gills and efficiently sift out the bad ones. Um, um, we could discuss that uh, later. Um, so I want to just make sure that we understand how gills are supposed to work. Um, the idea is, um, in this context, uh, if you want to make money in the medical tourism sector, you want referrals. If the referrals come to depend on having a gill, you will want to, to have that label. You will want um, a gill for that even if the gill costs you a lot by way of helping the local poor. Um, the way this works is not through regulation necessarily. It doesn't have to be a government that is in this business. It could be a nonprofit that is providing that information. It could be a government. It could be a government telling its insurers you must abide by that. But all of this could happen through the free market. So it doesn't necessarily give rise to regulation and things that some libertarians would object to. So it's contingent with respect to this um, to, um, to give any sort of concern of the kind that some libertarians have with um, some forms of ethical regulation of markets. It's not necessary here. Um, 
there was a nice article by um, uh, members of our uh, 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 of the group in Simon Fraser that does provide proposes something similar. Uh, it asks what should Canadian doctors be told about medical tourism so that they could tell that to their patients. In a way, the gills are a little similar to that. Only my emphasis is also they would tell things about what going to India and working with a very particular hospital, so it's very detailed information, um, does to access to health practitioners by the local population in a systematized way, in a way that is as the data is in and changes and different hospitals change policies, it's always updated and um, it's very easy to, um, the, the data is um, presented in, in uh, ways that are easy to uh, translate into action. It's not just indices and numbers that it's hard to make sense of. It can be very simple at the output uh, level. It can be you know, a green or a red mark. It can be numbers from 1 to 10 smiley face or lack of a smiley face and things of that sort um, that would be easy even for the local practitioner to make sense of or even for the consumer of a product to make sense of. Um, compare this, I don't know, that's, I'm not going to have time to elaborate on this, so that's just for, for the few of you who know uh, about Thomas Pogge's Health Impact Fund. Uh, in one word, he said, if you want people in poor countries to have access to medicines. You don't have to beg to these greedy pharma companies to do nice things for the poor. You could put together a whole lot of money and give it to the pharma company that you judge retrospectively did the most for the global poor. You create material incentives for the pharma company to help the poor. And it knows that there will be an independent panel of experts that meet afterwards, not before. Afterwards, they will look at their operations and check whether they helped or not and how much they helped and how much can really be attributed to their operations. So it will create the incentives you need. Compare this to what we're doing here. I mean, it addresses different problems. One of them is access to medicines and another one is access to doctors. And, but just basically the tool that I'm proposing is one that costs a fraction. You only have the panel of experts. You don't need the big, big, big bundle of money that could incentivize a big pharma company to give up a lot of opportunity, um, a lot of opportunities and work for the local, for, for the global poor. You simply give a mark and count on the market power of the consumers, of the investors, of the workers. So it's cheaper to make others do the work for you rather than do it yourself. Um, importantly, this gill, it doesn't have to be a very, very highly reputed organization. In principle, it could be you and I. We could start a nonprofit and if we can get, it would take us more years than it would get an operation that already has high reputation. But it, it could be just anybody who starts a gill it's quite amazing that you could have this global reach, global impact. You can resolve the prisoner's dilemma between the different operators around the world because you are not just one government. You affect hospitals and middlemen, etc., all over the world if that's what you monitor. So. A guild potentially overcomes the prisoner's dilemma that we mentioned earlier, if everything works. There are challenges. I'll mention some. Um, so here is one. You know, I'm counting on the good heartedness, not of corporations. Them, I'm assuming, are kind of 100% greedy, or, or at least we don't have to assume anything different for the purposes of today's talk. But I am assuming that somebody, the investors, the consumers, they do care and they would care about the gill. Now, how is that justified? We know from the big trouble that corporate social responsibility is facing. People did research there. And these research results are from America. There are even more extreme results from Europe. Um, people say, yeah, if you survey, oh, absolutely, I, I would buy ethically 
But in fact, people talk and talk and don't do the walk. Don't uh, walk the walk. Um, how can we count on these people to make, say, consumption choices according to whether a company, a hospital, a middleman organization, an insurer has the gill and um, uh, create the incentives for the companies to promote global health? First, I've mentioned already that gills could affect how much consumers care and how much they act accordingly. We shouldn't assume that consumers are kind of static in that way. Just have a snapshot in time. Once you have an insurer which is under guild, the other insurer will try, because they're greedy, to educate the public about how important it is ethically to go with certified insurers. So we can count on some improvement in people's caring when a gill creates market incentives for companies to say that the gill is important ethically. And we don't need to have anything like full compliance. What we need is enough to create some substantial incentive to improve how much you help the global poor. The more we achieve of that, the better. And uh, I do expect that there would remain many consumers who don't care, but maybe enough others would to create a very big impact. There would probably remain a market niche for uncertified hospitals, which remain cheaper for particularly uncaring consumers. That's okay, we can live with that. Something is better than nothing. Um, so um, I don't see on that ground uh, reasons simply not to introduce them. There are also uh, various other challenges. There are complicated questions on how these expert panels exactly would. The world is complicated. India is complicated. Thailand is complicated. How would these experts know what would best help the local populations? It's always complex to try to regulate and, and improve public health and do things like that. And that would, the challenge would arise for experts, local, international, uh, just as much in this context. Um, there are big questions about how to keep out bogus gills, which will be set up by private companies to say, you know, we're also a gill. They will try to hide their commercial interests. And we have found after a lot of examination that this hospital and this hospital paid us are great. You'd have the good gill and the bad gill, the pseudo gill, if you will. Consumers would not know in advance whom to believe. We know this from other markets. Um, this could happen. And the question is how to, have, to create an umbrella of the good gills that is relatively free, both from these and from, here's another kind of bad gill. You know, as I said, you and I could start a gill. And there are a lot of high school students out there who need the CV line to get into good universities and who will start their stupid little gills with zero expertise and very opinionated ideas about what's great for India, although they know very little about India, etc. We need some ways of, of filtering out the bad gills from the good gills. And it's a quite complex question of, of kind of um, for the planner to, to create a system that does that eff efficiently. We could discuss that during the questions uh, later. So um, uh, there are also questions which I will address briefly now before we open this um, uh, for, for your uh, discussion um, about how not to be too intrusive into what's happening in these health workers' lives in the case of the medical tourism guilds. These consumers, you know, in Vancouver, they buy the certified uh, services because they have some ideas about what 
patients in India need. And before you know it, hospital workers in India are being sent by their bosses, work in the, you know, I know you have a family, but I'm paying your salary. I want you to do three months every year in this rural area that you never wanted to work in. How is that supposed to be ethically legitimate? And is it okay? I mean, these are foreigners, and we are talking about sovereign countries. Um, India, for sure, is a democracy. How exactly is it legitimate that these patients from Vancouver have that impact on, you know, it's kind of exciting to have that global reach, but also scary to give that to a lot of people who, you know, why should they decide what's happening in other countries with democratic electorates and people who have very good ideas of what should happen in their country. So um, let me focus very quickly on these last two points and then uh, we'll open it to questions. When is it a good idea to finish? When? Okay, I'll, I'll do that. So I want to argue that there isn't a very disturbing violation of the sovereignty of the countries uh, which are the destination for medical tourists. Um, first, Gills actually, because of the prisoner's dilemma that we mentioned, you know, it's kind of complex, but in a way it's a way to coerce each individual actor into having this cooperation between the different prisoners in the dilemma in such a way that fulfills the individual wills of all these individual actors. What do I have in mind? I think that a lot of health workers, maybe not go to the rural areas for three months, but less extreme stuff. You know, these are the average doctor. If you look all over the world, people who go into med school, there is, if you survey them, there is a lot of altruism in their explanation for why they went to med school rather than to IT or engineering or law, or whatever. These are smart kids who could, could have probably done a lot of other things. They do care some about medicine and they do care some about the patients who need medicine the most. It's not like it excites them to work with the gringos uh, or the healthier local populations um, and that's why they do it. They remain there for the money. They want to provide for their families and maybe that's perfectly legitimate. Suppose they could get the same money and spend part of their time doing what they went into med school even more to do. I don't see a reason to assume in advance that for the bulk of them this would be a gross violation of what they want to do. I think it's probably going to be the opposite way. So you are imposing something on the individual actors in a way that helps us achieve a solution to a prisoner's dilemma that otherwise affects all of us. Same thing I think for the governments, for the hospitals, Many of the families who own these hospitals in India are doctors. It's not like they have any fundamental objection to being helpful to the local poor. They can't afford to do it right now. Maybe with this arrangement they could. So in a way it enhances their autonomy. It's also the case that in regular market operations, health workers specifically are seeing a lot of uh, orders. Go to third floor and treat that patient. We no longer want you here in this hospital, if you want to continue to work with our chain, you need to move to Chennai, etc. You could, you could find that in the market. This is no exception. Um, I mentioned that a lot of uh, worry arises, at least for me, about international organizations that are opinionated about things that happen in remote countries that they don't see. I think something that um, is assuring for me is that we're not talking about, because we are talking about very basic health needs, there aren't big secrets there. By and large, this is simpler for the experts to verify than a lot of other questions that we might have about what would be good for the patients in a certain country or not. It's good for people to have more doctors. It, it's pretty safe to assume that. If there is a way to get the doctors to go there, usually that would improve. Yes, there would be exceptions. Maybe there is a 
community somewhere in Northeast Thailand with a very special idiosyncratic religion that the Westerner expert maybe doesn't know about, whereby if the doctors go there, it's a huge gross violation, were you worse than death or whatever. I'm saying these things are the exceptions. You need to make some crude decisions if you want to have decision procedures that by and large help much more than they harm. And uh, I think that this is an area where we are relatively safe. So that gives me some consolation when I have worries about this scheme. I'll skip this and I think we're done. Um, what I argued is that a gill for the medical tourism industry could uh, help alleviate um, shortages in India and Thailand if the medical tourism sector creates them and if it doesn't. Um, such a uh, gill uh, could, I think, fruitfully complement the arsenal of interventions that legal scholars and human rights uh, scholars have been considering for um, resolving this challenge and many other challenges of medical delivery and the supply of medicines and many other uh, for global health. So I'm looking forward to discussing this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. pa pardon, sorry? Yeah. I don't want my government funding medical tourism. I don't want my insurer to pay for someone to go somewhere else. I want it done here. If the Canadian government is going to fund it, the Canadian government is going to do it, and I want it done in Canada. Uh -huh. I don't want people paying for someone else to do it. Um, look, first, um, I think it, you might be out of luck. Uh, I think in a few years it will happen. Um, and it's kind of going to happen unrelated to the Gill issue. Besides, I, I actually don't think, and I don't know what my colleagues from Simon Fraser uh, think about that, but I don't think that it's necessarily a big problem. If, if you know, cars can be produced or uh, cotton can be produced uh, better in one country than another, more cheaply, more efficiently, more effectively, then often it's fine for patients, or for, sorry, for, the for, for that to be produced in that country. For patients, I mean, it depends on the condition. Sometimes flying across the world for something is very difficult. That should, of course, enter the equation. And the, yeah, the Canadian government should be thinking about that. So maybe not for conditions where it's unsafe to keep the person stable uh, across, in a flight across the world. But, you know, I wouldn't send anybody to India to give birth. Um, but um, for other conditions, um, maybe you're being too conservative. Maybe you should be open to the idea of doing it in India. I mean, if the Gill thing works, actually, look at what happens. These, India has an income. You get equally good care, maybe better care. You or your government pays less, so there is more money for education, etc., and good stuff. Uh, India gets income, fantastic, no? There's also a social structure built within my own community that revolves around all of these things. And so when I look at universal health care in Canada, and it's not that I, I'm trying to dispute the fact that people in India need the care that they need, but why would I want to turn that over to a private sector? It makes no sense to me. Why would I give that up and give it to a private sector at any time? I mean, I will fight that all the way. Any government that comes in and tries to privatize health care in Canada, I will fight. We were talking about potentially public funding for services provided by the private sector in a, in a different country. Um, it comes with all the you know, bad stuff of private sector. So, you know, as I mentioned, it is very consumer oriented, all these kind of unnecessary machines. Choices I've made in life, right, wrong, or indifferent, 
You have to judge on that. Because nobody here or anyone else can honestly say what is the right choice to make. And I guess that's yeah. what I'm it's, it's a It's a larger debate. I, I think we, in a way, what you're saying is, I'm not sure that this addresses the guilt component. Maybe it addresses the medical tourism component, uh, but I, I'm not, I don't think I'm committing to kind of being for or against medical tourism in general. I'll mention to you that a lot of experts, I mean, I'm, uh, I grew up in a country where a lot of them, not only was all funding for medical services, central government, uh, also the provision of medical services was by and large public, and it's moved uh, at some point to public funding, private insurer uh, provision. Um, and um, I think a lot of experts <coughs> in general, so people who care about universal coverage, who care about central funding like I do, uh, are often um, less concerned, somewhat less concerned about whether it's going to be public or private provision of services. You're right that there are questions. It's hard for us to say, check whether doc monitor doctors and check whether they are doing good. And there is the danger that a non-compassionate doctor, greedy doctor, would not be doing good when the patient is not, you know, able to catch them in their error. But uh, you know, I see my medical students. They are. They know that working self-engineering to make themselves more compassionate is going to generate revenue in the future because we can see when a person is not very compassionate and we can uh, choose in the private market doctors with tendencies to be compassionate. So it, it's quite complicated um, how much uh, the provision of care needs to be public. A lot of experts are actually nowadays think that the most important com uh, component is the public provision of funding. Yeah, Jeremy, yeah. Just on that point, I mean, it might even be, it might be helpful to sort of make a distinction here between uh, medical tourism and travel abroad that's paid privately out of pocket, which does happen in Canada now all the time, and uh, publicly funded or insurer funded, uh, called schmedical tourism, or some people call it cross-border care, or, you know, we could put even a different label on that. Very similar issues in terms of the gills. It might be, you know, you definitely want to talk about both forms of travel, but it might be the case that in Canada you'll have a lot of the privately paid as you do now, but there, over the long term, would be a, a very strong government implemented limit on the uh, private or insured funding of it. Uh, and in America, not, not the case at all. Uh, but I, I did want to ask a, um, a question about, so you, you were, you d dismissed the idea that um, India or Thailand could self-impose uh, this, or, or you said it would be really mm -hmm. tough to do, so you're going to have a, a race to the bottom sort of situation where if India self-imposes these regulations, or, or actually forces the regulations that are on the books, prices go up, consumers go away. Um, but I, I think, I, I guess I, I'm less sure that that's the case. And, one of the reasons we're thinking of that just in that, in, in, with our research group, you know, we've, we've interviewed some Canadians and we looked at some of these website sites. It seems like in a lot of cases, it's actually hard for consumers, patients, whatever you want to call them, to actually get a good feel for what the prices for a lot of these services are. It's, it's pretty hard to do shopping, uh, comparison shopping. A lot of times the websites don't advertise prices. You actually have to go there or call ahead or work through a broker. So the sort of price comparisons you can do with a pair of shoes or coffee or that sort of thing are a lot harder mm -hmm. to do at least. And again, because this isn't a pair of shoes or whatever, so a lot of times um, the patients are going to be averse to you know, the, the cheapest care available, right? If you're going for a heart valve replacement, you may not want the cheapest one, actually. Mm -hmm. You may want to mm -hmm. pay quite a bit more. Um, and again, you, you made the, the point that you know, when Bangladesh imposed regulations on its um, uh, apparel manufacturing or whatever, you know, immediately they all went off to China. But again, because this is a different kind of good, this is a, this requires highly skilled workers, very, very expensive facilities, um, there'd be reasons for doubting that the supply could up and move as quickly. You need to get the American, the North American market, you need English speakers, having degrees from certain places helps, mm -hmm. uh, highly skilled, you, you can't just, you know, school up really, really quickly. So, I mean, those would be some reasons for hoping that India actually could 
not only that it wouldn't lead to an immediate collapse of its industry if it did mm -hmm. impose these regulations, but then it could do gill-like things too, try to self-advertise and say, you know, India as a name brand uh, is more reputable than Thailand mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, some of these other places too. So, at any rate, some, some reasons to be mm -hmm. a little bit more hopeful about that. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I can imagine, I mean, the latter point is especially intriguing. I think that it does, it. so I think in the surrogacy market, I think, say, Panama is hoping to get a reputation of being more ethical in its treatment of the pregnant women than India, which is much cheaper. So, so some, some, some sectors work that way. And I'll, I'll kind of enhance your, kind of expand the, the thought. So when people do talk about corporate social responsibility, it basically completely doesn't work for some types of sectors and for some very niche markets, it works fantastically well. So for some reason, for hybrid cars, for uh, cage-free eggs, and you know, one of these sectors where it works is the body shop, right? People don't like, you know, it's a soap, you put it in your body and you can, if it's an unethical soap, then you know, so, or Ben and Jerry's, you, you put it into your mouth and if it's a sort of unethical ice cream, no matter, you know, Ben and Jerry, they're not, re it's, you know, it's no longer the original owners, it's all that, people don't know all that, but they think of Ben and Jerry's as the ethical ice cream, and that helps Ben and Jerry's, you know, charge more and get more consumers. Um, and maybe the thought continues to go: it's your body, it's the operation, it's your your child. If it's a surrogacy service, you want it to be associated with ethics rather than associated with unethics. Um, something of that sort. I can imagine that working for. Some patients, so I, you know, some portion of patients, and in a way, I am counting on somewhat similar mechanisms. Gills still do the work of telling you what is the truth about those issues, rather than because the thing is, again, it's misleading to take a sort of snapshot picture right now. This is very dynamic. It's going to look very different in a few years. So. Um, there will be many operators out there who claim to be ethical. And also, I think there will be many operators out there who, if the prices continue to be vague, will be providing services for making the prices more transparent. Come to our Consumer Reports website, and we'll tell you how much it really costs. And that may well happen if it's a huge global market. Um, um, so. I think still a guild could, 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 could have, have a, an important contribution in, in such a picture. Also, yes, changes couldn't happen overnight, but I'm talking about the long run, so after a few years of inelasticity, some movement between global markets. Um, we see that all the time in the, you know, an example is the illegal black global market for organs. Yeah, it's difficult for operators to move between countries, but they do once every year, two years, three years, uh, because of the kind of same thing that moves sweatshops between countries, uh, plus regulatory um, problems that arise in some countries. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. I was <laughs> sorry, sorry. Is that, yeah. was that a, was that a yes? Go for it. I was thinking the other way around, but we'll do both. Yeah. So I just wanted to. In terms of medical tourism hospitals, right, the language of medical tourism hospitals, um, just, to, just to temper that a bit, um, is that these are existing private facilities that have, are basically targeting the private local market, right? And med medical tourism is just a very tiny portion that is basically used to supplement their income. So in terms of thinking about, um, again, just touching on Jerry's point about, you know, uh, race to the bottom, uh, uh, suppliers are okay, uh, it's, it, that's unlikely in terms of they're, they're there, they're there to stay, they're there to serve the local market, medical tourists are just coming in and using some of the services. And again, also thinking about in terms of the numbers around medical tourism and, and, and the scope of the industry, um, the, the North American traveling to the global south or the European traveling to the global south to access carriers is, is the popular sensational image. It's what? Is the popular uh -huh. sensational image, but in terms of uh, again, these like the, the whole chain. The, the, what they're actually drawing on is, you know, Pakistanis, okay. Bangladeshis, this kind of things. And in terms of the gill and, mm -hmm. and people purchasing with their with ethics, they're often leaving similar socioeconomic context, right? And so, in terms of the purchasing, whether well, or not they're really thinking about these things. Again, just just to, mm -hmm. just to throw more wrenches in terms of who, yeah. who medical tourists actually are. 
Good. Um, I don't, so you're totally right that I wouldn't call it a fraction, I think was the term or whatever. I mean, medical tourism is substantial, but yes, compared to the Indian middle class, uh, that's where Apollo draws mo most of its income. I don't see how that stops the race to the bottom worry that I have about Apollo trying to be good. If they try to be good, they will have to, you know, if I'm talking about really good, uh, I was talking about tenth of the beds. I'm talking about you know quarter of the month. If they try to be substantially gooder, they will have to jack up prices for the local elites and the foreign elites, and it's going to be another operator that the local elites go to. So no individual actor can um, change that. I guess the government of India could be the Leviathan inside India, because the low, the, I assume maybe that's what you have in mind. So the Indian middle class would probably not travel all the way to Thailand to get care there. It's here in New Delhi, I'll just go here. So that's, that's uh, fair, that's good. Um, but I, I, I do think that the India government is very much concerned about the big you know, uh, revenues that this generates now and will generate even much, much more in the future. And I just don't see the Indian government kind of giving up on that for the sake of, um, I mean, the finance ministry hasn't shown inclinations, as you know, to, to move in that direction. Yeah. It's very, the regulatory and financing, health financing system in India is broken, right? And that's, that's the problem with India. Medical tourism, regardless of what was happening, the existing problems would be there. It's, it's how do you develop that political momentum in India to address these issues, right? Yeah, it's part of what people say is things like, why are you accusing the industry? You should, there are other issues, I mean, state and federal government and the northern uh, part of India versus the more successful recently southern cities and all that. Why do you uh, blame our little industry for that? Um, look, if there is a way to leverage anyone, including that industry, to address these problems, whether or not the industry should be blamed for having created them, um, I go there. Guilds are not about making people fix problems that they have created. They're about increasing impact. If with this private sector that is more successful in generating good clinical outcomes, I can achieve that, that that's good enough for me. So the slide you missed is about Guilds not being about ethics. They're about impact. It's not about fair trade. It's not about social responsibility in some kind of ethically charged term the way I see it. It's really about mobilizing agents, corporations that are among the most effective agents out there in the world to address the things that I want somebody to address. Um, this is a much more complicated ethical discussion that on this slide that I, I'm not going to go to. Um, yes? So, I think two of the issues that I wanted to raise have already been raised by um, my colleagues here. But the last issue was to kind of pick up on the point that you make about certain, certain niche markets having different levels of corporate social responsibility um, and being responsible mm. to varying degrees depending on the services that are provided or whatever goods they are responsible for. And I think based on the evidence thus far about the urban transplant industry, medical tourism is, does not seem necessarily to be one of those that would rank high in terms of the onus of responsibility being accepted by the private companies or by the private hospitals in order to provide this kind of, you know, I think there'd have to be a much stronger regulatory pressure from outside, which I, I honestly, don't think based on the evidence that is from various disciplines, medical anthropology, medical sociology, yeah. geography, and yeah. health sciences on the whole, I don't know whether Gills would really answer that. You know, because you need, I think, much more on the ground rather than top-down management for that to be implemented in reality in these contexts. I think Gills, um, like many other brands and other um, little labels on things mm -hmm. that guarantee
guarantee that it's fair trade and that mm. place the ownership of responsibility for making decisions upon consumers, mm. like many others, um, and other logos like that, I think they would probably fall quite a bit short. Yeah. Um, bad deals would. Uh, good deals are defined as the ones that actually monitor successfully what is happening on the ground. And the question is, of course, is whether any good deals will exist. There's a whole system which I could discuss with you that I, I, I'm, I'm working on to kind of to, to uh, separate the good ones from the bad ones. Um, in principle, I don't see why the regulators operating on behalf of the government or whatever couldn't, you know, these are experts. A guild could be run by experts. Uh, if you need feedback from the ground, from the stakeholders, from the community, they could be consulting very regularly in a very systematic way, the local patients. So, you know, you have a hotline for the patients from the village and whenever there is a no-show on the part of the doctor from the medical tourism operation that is supposed to be there this morning, they can give a ring and say, where is the doctor? Or the experts meet the community leaders regularly and collect uh, feedback on the operations. Insofar as we have any way of collecting information, they, they could use that. So you're totally right in the medical tour, in the organ markets. Really good, but yep. it's really just a temporizing measure, right? Because without, it doesn't really, it's a temporizing measure, it doesn't address the actual gaps that exist, the health care disparities that mm -hmm. exist and are perpetuated by medical tourism. Sure, we should address these gaps. That, I think that's, the, that's my big problem. Um, I don't see why it's a problem. To it. So it's a bit like saying, uh, doctor, I hate it. I resent the fact that you treat my arm because I have a bigger problem of cancer in my lug. Uh, no, I mean, you know, you do what you can. Um, Yes, I'm all with you, and I work on trying to address um, some more fundamental problems. Um, one thing about, you know, um, just a point, methodological point. Uh, anthropologists look at black markets for organs, uh, and, and I think a little too often conclude uh, what some economists have said about legalizing the market, uh, I mean, this is a very different question, I'm just kind of I'm using the, uh, this to plug in something, uh, is this is their pipe dreams, it, it's, it's not like that on the ground, etc. Um, these people are, li you know, they, they read their kind of formulas and they, they're not looking at what's really happening on the ground, on the ground these markets are harming we know the uh, organ sellers are not really promoting them as some economists are, are uh, assuming in a legal market they would tend to help them. Um, anthropology helps us a lot in seeing what's currently on the ground. What it doesn't necessarily help us see is what would happen if we had some very different scheme. So while I'm not sure that the economists are right, in being very optimistic about what would happen if we legalized markets, we simply cannot conclude from the fact currently under the black market, things look awful and there is neglect and the operations that in principle could have been very hygienic or non-hygienic and there is terrible stigma, etc. It doesn't immediately follow if this were legal, uh, there would be this rosy picture that some libertarian economists are painting um, looking at what's currently on the ground is important for some purposes, but it doesn't tell us everything about the reforms that we could put in place and what would happen after such reforms. So an example that I've, I've heard once from, I was in a panel with Alvin Roth, who actually this year won the Nobel Prize in Economics. Uh, he said, you can't conclude from, you know, if you look uh, during the uh, 1920s and the illegal market for alcohol in the US, it looked pretty awful and mafia was in it, etc. If you concluded, oh, come on, if we, the economists might tell us that if we legalize alcohol selling, it's going to be a rosy picture and clean shops and all that, 
But look at look, look on the ground. What's happening? It's it's awful, and the uh, criminals are involved in all that. Um, that would have been misleading. In fact, what happened once it became legal is, you know, the sort of clean elite wine shops that you can find in everywhere around the U.S. Um, it doesn't have to work by perpetuating the um, processes that you see before reform. I agree with that, but I also think it requires that systems be in place and systems be That's built what it for. on the ground up, which I don't necessarily think is the case right now. So, unfortunately, we have time to have a discussion, but we'd like to take a for this talk. That's a good question.